the information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Andy Duncan, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, good evening and welcome to this Gold Money Podcast with me, your host, Andy Duncan. Tonight, I'm very pleased to be speaking to Catherine Austin Fitz, who is the publisher of the Solari Report. She's also a former director of Wall Street investment firm Dylan Reed, which is now part of UBS, a former president of the Hamilton Securities Group, and also a former Federal Housing Commissioner and Assistant Secretary of Housing under the first U.S. Bush administration. Hello, Catherine. Andy, it's always a pleasure. First of all, before we get going, I've got to ask you, where do you get all this energy from to have such a power-packed resume? (laughs) You know something? I love what I do. I, from a very young age, I decided I would only do what I loved. And so I don't, you know, I don't see what I do as work. I see what I do as, as, you know, sort of following my passion. So, and in fact, you know, now I look, I look at, we have a lot of guests on the Solari Report, and I look at their resumes, and I think, you know, I haven't accomplished very much in my life. Crikey, you've you've done a hundred times more than I've ever done, Uh or can even imagine doing. Bet you have kids, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. See, there you go. I don't have kids. I think Murray Rothbard as well, and uh, Ludwig von Mies has never had uh, children, so that that gave them a tremendous amount of uh, time on their hands to, to write wonderful things with. After all of your time in Washington and in Wall Street, there were many career options that you could have chosen, but you started Solari. Can you tell us why you started Solari and what are your firm's objectives? What happened was when I started Hamilton Securities Group in Washington and then we got embroiled in very extensive litigation with the with the federal government in the U.S. And as a result, I really dug in and said, OK, the corruption is much greater than, you know, I mean, for most of my lifetime, the corruption was there, but it didn't interfere with the overt economy in the way that it does now. And so I said, I've really got to research the corruption and where it's going. And a lot of that research focused on mortgage fraud. And in the process, Andy, I was forced uh, by the litigation to speak publicly. You know, I come from a background where you only talk about your 20 closest colleagues about money, honestly. And then suddenly I found myself getting on the radio and talking, you know, with millions of people about money. And as a result, I started to get thousands of questions by emails. And I made a command decision in 1998 that I would just try to answer all those emails honestly. And believe it or not, that evolved into three businesses, one of which is an investment advisory firm, um, one of which is a money management firm, and the other is the Solari Report, where once a week, I report to people about what I think is going on and what they can do to take action to protect their wealth. And it, literally, those three businesses simply evolved out of people asking me questions. And for many years, people would say, well, what what do I do with my assets? And I would say, well, you know, I'm not an investment banker. And after, I mean, I'm not an investment advisor. So, and after about the thousandth question, I realized, I guess I am an investment advisor. <laughs> You'd become one. Well, you know, it was really funny because if you look at all my skills, you know, I had tremendous skill sets, but all the people that I normally worked for, you had to sort of go to the light or you had to go to the dark. And so I needed to reinvent my business where I could protect private families and private individuals from the corruption as opposed to work for the guys who were implementing the corruption. You know, so it was a big switch to get to get out of working for big corporations and get into working for private families. But I, I, that's what I do now, and I love it. Sounds like a great thing. Now, as a federal housing commissioner, you must have been close to the kind of mortgage corruption. Do you think the corruption tentacles spread ever further from there at all? Well, I, you know, it, it kept getting worse and worse. You know, it was during the 80s. If you look at the mortgage fraud that went on during the 80s, I was... I came in in 1989 and was part of the cleanup team. You know, you have the team that does the corruption and then you bring a cleanup team and then you do the, you know, it's a pendulum that swings back and forth. If you look at the corruption during the 80s, it was much more uh, relegated to certain kinds of places in certain neighborhoods. And there was a very strict line between the covert part and the overt part. And what happened in the 90s was it, it kind of busted through. And the fraud went to uh, across the market. So it went from the low income communities and sort of special deals to something that was everywhere. And I think that in part is because you saw a decision to, to literally shift massive money out of the economy. But 
there's no doubt that the fraud went on scale. But I think the mortgage fraud before then was far more significant than most people went, you know, believed. And it was very interesting. I started to warn people about the extent of the mortgage fraud in 1998. And as I warned them, they couldn't fathom what I was saying. They couldn't fathom that it was that bad. And I think then when 2008, when the crash happened, you saw global investors taking very significant losses and realizing, you know, this percentage of loss and these per- percentage of recovery rates cannot exist unless there is systemic and serious fraud. So I'll give you one story just as an example. For many, many years, I did a radio show in in the San Francisco Bay Area where, as the former assistant secretary, I would talk about the extent of the not only the mortgage fraud, but the related securities fraud. And, you know, this went on for years, and I'm the former assistant secretary of housing talking about it. In 19, in, I'm sorry, in 2008, when Fannie Mae was nationalized, you had a very respected, very capable San Francisco money manager had taken a position of a billion dollars in the stock in March and then proceeded to take a billion dollar right down in May, in uh, August. And they put up on their website, they put up on their website an, a letter saying, you know, we did extensive due diligence. We had no idea. <laughs> I was saying, how, how could they have no idea? Because you have the former assistant secretary of housing on the radio for the last five years warning of this. And frankly, if you, if you drive around America, er, you know, every trucker in America knew the extent of the problem. So we, we sort of, what we're watching now is we're watching an integration of worlds as people start to, you know, realize that these things that have been sort of kept hidden and from certain pockets, you know, are no longer hidden. Now, we've seen recently uh, with the Dow Jones going to over 15,000 points uh, recovering from 2008, at least in nominal terms. But even though it's gone over 15,000, there doesn't seem to be any real economic improvement in the Western world or in the United States. We've got Mr. Bernanke, who sees his job as blowing financial bubbles to make sure none of the mega banks kind of go under with this kind of QE to infinity. Do you think there is an economic improvement in the United States or, or is it just all smoke and mirrors? Well, it's very, it's very fractured. I don't, I don't think it's simple. What we saw during the 90s was an effort to take tremendous capital out of the developed world and, and do what's called rebalance the global economy. Now, what that means is for the middle class and people who are outside the system leading that, that's very bad news. And both in Europe and in the United States, we have, you know, so in the United States, we literally have a hundred trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities to ourselves and how that's going to be worked out. Cause essentially what we've done is we've pulled the capital behind those promises and taken it elsewhere. And so if you are someone in one of the emerging market countries that's had the benefit of that capital, you would say that things are better off. If you were here, you would say things are worse off. Now, If you look at the different sectors in the United States, you have several sectors that have been reorganized to be able to compete globally. One is agriculture and one is energy. We've seen tremendous growth of the energy sector here domestically in terms of domestic drilling and the cost of energy come down dramatically in a way that in fact makes U.S. manufacturing and U.S. a lot of economic activities much more competitive globally. So I think if you're in in those sectors, you know, if you're up in North Dakota drilling oil, you're feeling that the economy is pretty good. If you're in Tennessee, where I live, in most places, you're feeling pretty bad. And so the way I would say it is we have a, you know, we have a new economy growing and we have an old industrial economy dying and the creative destruction is quite painful. The most painful of that is what you said, which is you've got the central bank's debasing the currency globally, and that's wiping out many, many people. So I would say unemployment here is much greater than is being described in the official statistics. Is for a variety of reasons. With that unemployment, you have a tremendous increase in a lack of trust in the system, which is, of course, as you know, is very, very damaging to the economy. But it's a, it's a mixed bag because as you see, the central bankers and the sovereign governments continue to print very and inject significant amounts of money in the middle of it. Now, you mentioned the debasing there. And uh, I just noticed on your website today that you've introduced a Solari coin, which is a one ounce silver coin, which you're going to give to your new subscribers. 
Does this mean that to avoid debasing that you're uh, you're a believer in gold and silver as money? Yeah, I I have been a believer in gold and silver for a long time. To me, gold remains the ultimate payment system within the global economy. And you know, it's funny you go when I first started to learn about gold and silver, it was James Turk who was one of the first people who started to educate me. I think he called he called me out of the blue in 2000 and we started to talk. One of the things I discovered, Andy, is no matter where you travel in the world, you know, whether it's in the tiniest town in America or in Asia or Latin America, everybody recognizes gold and silver as money. Everybody, you know, it's, it's the, it's the one, it is the global currency that we all share. And to me, it has a history and it has an acceptance and a brand, which makes it very, very unique. And in the institutional circles, it continues to be one of the ultimate payment forms. So to me, gold and silver are money and they, they work as money. And there are several attributes of gold and silver, which I think are very unique. And so to me, they're going to be a very important part of the evolution of currencies on planet Earth. Yeah, I know in places like Vietnam, uh, gold is money, isn't it, in places uh, in that part of the world? Now, speaking of coins, like your Solari coin, a lot of the free market people at the moment have this fascination with bitcoins. Now, you've talked about gold and silver being an important part of the, uh, the future, and they have a good history. But do you think bitcoin is going to be part of a, a future alternative to fiat monies as well? Well, I, you know, if, if you, I think if we were to sit down in a room with the top, the top people driving and managing the financial system, I think there's nothing that they would love more, Andy, than a digital currency. Nicholas Negroponte used to run the MIT Media Lab, and he said, in a digital age, data about money is worth more than money. And if you can ultimately emerge digital currencies, then the people who control the digital systems in the internet are going to have far more centralized power and control. Their access to real-time data on what we all are doing <laughs> will be fantastic and amazing. So I think you know, clearly, if you're going to move to a global currency or, you know, successful, you know, right now we have a regional with the dollar and the euro. But if you're going to move to more centralized governance and financial systems, which I think is what they want, you, you love digital systems, particularly a digital system that is anonymous to the user or to, to many people in the system, not to you, ultimately, if you control the Internet, but one in which you don't have to put sovereign insurance behind it. If you look at something like Bitcoin, if I take money out of my bank, I take money out of a place where people know me. I don't have to depend on the digital systems because I can depend on the fact that they know their customer. They know me. I have paper records as well as digital records. And I've got FDIC insurance. If I move it out of that structure that has lots of risk management, lots of trust and lots of support, into something that is completely anonymous, I give up a tremendous amount if I go into it in any kind of size. Now, I'm going to put my conspiracy theorist hat on and ask you, do you think that uh, Bitcoin could be some kind of backdoor ploy by the powers that be to move us towards a completely digital currency? You know, to me, there's no way to tell. If you look at the original developer or group of developers, they're anonymous. But let's assume that, that Bitcoin is either, you know, was seeded by the top guys or it was not. It was a, it was an absolutely sincere effort. In my experience, it doesn't really matter because the people who govern the financial system are great at letting things develop emergently and then taking them over or, or using the knowledge to, to do a replacement. So you let all sorts of grassroots efforts, some of them sincere, some of which you seed. And you let them prototype and develop the knowledge you need to do, you know, things on scale and you scale it up in an emergent fashion. And one of my concerns about the so-called cryptocurrencies of which Bitcoin is one is the more we depend on purely digital systems that have no tangible backing, the more we're going to encourage the kind of global digital currency that's centrally controlled that will you know, put us in harm's way. Now, that said, I love, uh, you know, I love choice. And so if people want to put money in Bitcoin, you know, God bless them. I have no objection. But I know that anybody who thinks that the central bankers can't control 
uh, cryptocurrencies is just dreaming. If, if Jeff Tucker's listening to this now and about half of my friends, they'll probably be uh, having screaming fits at the moment. So, so, <laughs> so, so if we move back to gold, now gold is tangible. You can let, let me yep. just, just let me just say something. For 10 years or for five years, I developed digital software that threatened the central bankers. Yep. And I had the Department of Justice seize my offices, seize the databases. It took me $6 million in six years to get the databases out of court control and the, and literally the computers, this, the hardware and software. And when I got it back, the most powerful and important parts of that software had been stolen permanently while it was under court control. Oh, dear. And I spent, I spent 11 years, you know, I had 12 pieces of litigation, 18 audits, investigations, a smear campaign and physical harassment. So let me tell you, when the central bankers want something done, they can get it done. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, speaking of what central bankers may or may not have been doing, we've seen tremendous Bitcoin price volatility, but we've also seen a lot of uh, gold price volatility. Now, despite all the fundamentals, to, at least to my eyes, pointing that gold is going up, up, up and away, like Superman, it actually went down recently with a massive drop, and it's still holding today, I think, about $14.55. Do you think that this was just a market correction in gold after a big rise up or is something else going on behind the scenes? Well, gold's been in, you know, gold peaked in September 2011 and has been consolidating ever since. And this is a pretty long consolidation. It's not longer than ones we've seen in the 70s, but it is longer than ones we've seen since the bull market started in the late 90s. So this is a major consolidation. And I think we all have to ask the question is the primary trend up in gold over and i would say no it's i'd give it 80 percent that the primary trend is still up but i think certainly the consolidation pattern has been very long now the recent down is quite mysterious because all signals are that we've seen such a strong bifurcation between the physical and the you know the paper market that something does seem to be quite manipulated about it now so, you know, I think we have to see what the price action is between now and the and the end of the fourth quarter to really make a judgment. So I think the my feeling is when we're in a scenario like this, we've had a very serious whack down, but it's rare that if the forces are committed to keeping the price low, my fear is we could get more whack downs before this is over. But I, I expect to see the price back up. And I think the reason... Andy, the important reason is that if you look at where the financial system is going, again, we have widespread global adoption of gold as the payment mechanism. And what's happened as a result of this last significant price drop in April, we're see I'm seeing much greater global buying at the retail level, which means in the long run, we have a much more broad based adaption, which is good for is good for gold investors. Yeah, I saw there was a great video on the Max Kaiser program last week of a, of a truck backing up and Max Kaiser talking about the Chinese <laughs> filling up that truck. Now, you, on a Financial Survival Network program last year, you said that $2,500 gold is some kind of war situation and that central banks are protecting bond markets because that's where governments get their money from. Do you still believe this? Uh, do you still think the price is 2500 and do you think we're getting close to some kind of on-the-ground war in maybe Syria, Iran, or North Korea? If you look at the still the, the economies globally that have leakage from what James Turk originally called the central banking warfare model, I think we're going to have progressive wars no matter what. Um, but the reason I said $2,500 gold is, means war is I don't think the gold market's clear by price. They clear by price up to a certain point or down to a certain point. But if you get too much volatility too fast, you get shocks in the system. And institutions globally are going to protect their ability to, to manage their positions. And we know that there is severe collateral fraud shortages within the gold system. Now we speculate it endlessly and can't prove a lot of it, but I, you know, bankers regularly will tell you that the, allocated pools at the banks don't have 100% gold backing them. So if you get too much of a run up too fast in the gold price, you can have extreme stress institutionally that can turn into contagion. And that's why I think, you know, above a certain amount at any given time, you're not going to clear with price, you're going to clear with war, which is why 
one of the reasons I said that, Andy, is oftentimes I see investors encouraged to believe, you know, oh, gold's going to 10,000 or gold's going to 8,000 or gold's going to, you know, sort of very optimistic or encouraged to feel very optimistically about the nominal prices of gold. And I try and discourage that because I think that we are in a situation where globally we're watching very tight central bank management or certainly an attempt to manage tightly. And above a certain incremental increase in price, you're going to get political resolutions, not price resolutions. And so I keep trying to explain to people the market's not going to clear with price. So stop hoping for these amazing prices. They're not going to happen. Now, speaking of James Turk, uh, he said that gold has a fair value of a much higher value than 2000 or 2500 but $11,000, which I think is central bank foreign exchange reserves divided by stated central bank gold reserves. Do you think that the central banks are going to manage gold up to this price very slowly? Uh, if you think that, do you think there's a timetable they're working to? Or do you think they're just going to keep killing gold every time it approaches 2000 Oh, Andy, wouldn't I love to know the answer to that question? You know, I've always felt, I refer to what happened between 1995 and, and 2008 as the financial coup d'etat. And what I believe grossly oversimplified happened was the, and, and we'll call the people who govern the financial system, Mr. Global. So I believe what happened was Mr. Global sucked an enormous amount of money out of the developed economies before the baby boomer liabilities came to maturation. And, you know, they sucked that money out and now they have that money. And my, sort of my theory is I've always believed that they wanted to manage rise in gold and they sold gold at the heart of a new global currency system. Because let's face it, once you, once you use fiat currency to steal all the money and to buy all the assets, then of course you want sound currency to protect your position, right? You want the stuff, not just heaps of paper. <laughs> well, you don't want that. Pay you don't want to get gamed by the paper system you just use to game everybody else. So I've always the reason I've always been in uh, belief that that gold was in a primary trend up is I believe that Mister Global has always you know would benefit from a managed rise. Now I say that, and if you look at where the central bankers are, they have a very delicate game to play here because we've run a you know, many decades bull market in the, in the bond market. And we have poured more and more money and more and more money and more and more money into the bond market, both sovereign and, and corporate. And that, you know, you've, you're talking about a huge amount of capital and with using derivatives and a, and a variety of other mechanisms, we've been able to bring the interest rate down so that very rarely have bond markets experienced terrible volatility and losses. Although 2008, they got a taste of it. And now the question is, how do you keep that money? It's like trying to keep a whole herd of cattle, you know, who are about to stampede. How do you keep them in there? And then how do you bubble the equity market so that you balance out the debt to equity? Because just like you want to move to sound currency, you want to move to a much more equity based model. And so how do you do that without a stampede out of the bond market, which you can't afford? Because that would bring contagion on a scale that the system can't afford. And I think. You know, if there was a legitimate reason for whacking down the gold price in April, it, it could have been that because we know the central banks are fighting, fighting deflation. And that's hard to do, especially when now we've got to rejigger the budgets in Europe and the United States and there's less fiscal juice with which to hold the paper up. So trying to keep everybody in the bond market is a, is a scary task. You know, I would note in, I was shocked in February. I was trawling around Morningstar and realized that the long treasury bond funds had a six month average return of negative 0.7 plus percent. Ooh. Exactly. That is Andy. That's exactly what I said. I said, Oh my, <laughs> you know what? You know, that's scary. If you're Ben Bernanke and long bonds have a negative 7% return, how are you going to keep everybody in the bond market? Well, the financial repression. This, this all sounds like a kind of experiment by deep thought in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> so, so if they're um, if they're working on getting to gold, you think what kind of timetable do you think they're working on? Well, here's the thing. I don't. You know, I don't. I think of this differently because I the, I look at financial. I look at currency as a financial tool within a governance system. And so you have a governance system and you have a variety of tools you use to govern. 
Some of those tools are financial tools. One of them is currency, which is obviously a very, very important and powerful one. But I think you have to look at that tool. You can't look at it on a standalone basis. You have to look at it within the context of who's really governing and and how do they want to govern and what is the system that they are evolving to. So let me give you a funny example. I think that one of the most important things in where they're trying to evolve as a currency system, I think gold is a very important one. I think another very important one is food. And we can talk about that if you like, but I was interested to notice, I was on a financial uh, forum the other day and the people on the forum were trying to kick off this uh, woman who'd been posting there because she kept bringing up food. And they said food was off topic. This was a financial forum. You need to leave. And they were getting together to sort of blackball her from the forum. And she kept saying, look, you, you know, it's not off topic at all. It's dead center to the issue of how we're going to create a new currency system. You need to go read these links that, you know, read these interviews with Catherine Austin. <laughs> and, but here's the, and here's why I mentioned this. If you look at the people who are managing the governing the planet and governing the financial system, they're thinking ecosystem wide. In other words, they're managing, you know, I don't know, Andy, did you ever see the old commercials of the Pillsbury Doughboy where you squeeze down on one, one part and he pops out on another part? No, but I, I get the idea. Okay. So, so, so they're managing ecosystem wide and there's very tight integration between what's happening in different sectors of the economy with what's happening with the currency. And, you know, everyone else has tended to stay very specialized. And I think we now need to think much more in, in a much more integrated form about who's really running things. How are they governing things? And how are they, how are they centralizing economic and political power? And the currency is part of that, but there are other related parts and we need to think of, of them together in terms of what is the governance system and who's really running things. Yeah, we saw the food issue come up, didn't we, with the Arab Spring, with the price of wheat going up in Egypt and Tunisia and various places, sort of uh, forcing the, uh, the, the Arab Spring. Now, one of the things I think might be a marker that we're approaching an endgame is, is if silver starts heading towards a kind of historic ratio to gold of 15 times, uh, and that might mean that we're heading towards the end of the central bank's endgame. What do you think of my theory there? Well, I've looked and have always been encouraged by the long-term ratios between gold and silver. Here's the one concern, because I'm speaking to you today from Silicon Valley, where I spend about uh, several months a year. It's where our money management firm is. And my only concern is you have, you have industrial uses of silver that could cause a, you know, the historical ratios to not play. In other words, Mr. Global has strong reasons to want gold to be at the heart of a new monetary system or regime, but has reasons to want to use silver in a variety of industrial ways. And my, my only concern, given the centralization of the system, is that could result in different trading ranges than we're used to seeing. So that's my, and that's a question mark. That's a mystery. I don't know the answer, but I don't, I don't underestimate the industrial uses of silver to take it out of the monetary realm more than has been the case historically. The idea of taking money away, the Federal Reserve keeps hinting that it's going to withdraw all of this extra feared currency from the system. Do you think that these hints are realistic or are they just playing for time until they can introduce your global uh, currency back by gold? At this point, I kind of feel about pronouncements from the Fed the way I feel about press releases from Paris Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to make of them, although I would say I, I certainly enjoy Paris Hilton's more. <laughs> so I, you know, I don't, I just think they're jawboning. Here's the reality. If you're the powers that be and you want to confiscate gold, it's much easier to have Goldman Sachs push the price down $140 than it is to pass a law and, and come bother people or knock on their doors. Uh, and empty all the ETFs. They can achieve anything they want with market management. So I think they'll, they job on a whole variety of different things, but when it comes to taking action, market manipulation, you know, will do the trick in 99.9% of the situations. I'm not so sure about their total omnipotence there. I mean, we, we've seen with the ECB saying one or two days before the Cyprus crisis that everything's fine and all the, the Cypriot government saying everything's fine one or two days before the Cyprus crisis, and then the whole thing just fell apart. 
What do you what do you think of the European economy? Is is it is it being used as an experiment by our global masters uh, to sort of play around with things, or are the pow- uh, governing powers just making a complete hash of everything? Well, it's complicated. What we know is that capital was moved out before the retirement liabilities of the baby boomers matured. So literally, I'll use the United States, which I know better. Literally, we've moved the money out and replaced it with a whole bunch of promises and IOUs. And I don't think that the group of politicians, either in the ECB or the United States, have the, you know, I certainly don't think they're omnipotent to deal with it. They're trying to manage expectations down and trying to deliver the bad news without crashing the system. So they've kind of been, you know, you, you pull the money out and then you leave, you leave everybody in it to stew in their own juices is kind of what's been happening and exactly how that works out and who wins and who loses remains to be seen. And it's going to be a long, slow, ugly process. But here's the question. What you're doing in both the European Union and the United States is you're set, you're centralizing control of key sectors like agriculture, like energy. And as you do that, you destroy the vibrancy in the small business economy. I was just in 2011, no, I guess 2012, I was in Portugal and spent a lot of time touring through the countryside. And you're literally seeing liquidity and credit shut off to the small business market. And you are systematically and very purposefully and intentionally imploding small business. You see the same thing here. So, for example, in the United States, you see the food safety rules used to destroy and wipe out hundreds and hundreds of dairies that are highly economic. So you're watching an intentional effort to centralize control of the economy. Now, is that so they can compete globally? Is that so they can consolidate globally? Is that so you can run all the money through corporate stocks instead of having it in private family hands? I mean, there are many different reasons why you might do it. But what you are doing is you are intentionally shrinking total wealth so that you can centralize control of it. But you are shrinking total wealth and it's on purpose. They know what they're doing. This is highly intentional. Yeah, I think the thing with food as well in Europe, I think they're going to make it um, that all seeds have to be regulated by the European government. Uh, So that's, again, taking control of food literally right at the root of things. Now, if they are shrinking the economy, and if they're successful, they're going to debase a lot of the middle class people around the world. How do you think our gold money subscribers can protect themselves from the from these central banks with these kind of um, depredations of their wealth? Well, I think if you understand what we're talking about, that we're in a long term squeeze, and that long term squeeze is generally in the developed world's Incomes are going to fall unless you're in one of the areas or sectors where there's a real strong economy growing. So so whatever your source of income, you want to make sure you're in a sector where those skills and those functions are growing. You know, I say there's an economy that's being born and an economy that's dying. You really want to make sure you get out of the economy that's dying and you shift your skills. So that's number one. Number two, if you look at the what I call the slow burn you're looking at steady increases in essential goods and services. So a steady increase in the price of food, a steady increase in the price of many different goods and services you need. And a lot of that is looking at your particular income statement balance sheet where you live in the world and saying, okay, how do I, the the fundamental economics of doing things for myself is changing. How do I take advantage of that given my unique circumstance? And then how do I protect myself from this inflation? And I think Part of it very much is gold and silver play an important role in helping to do that. But I think you also need real balance across your, across your assets and your balance sheet because we're now looking, Andy, at a world where if you look across all the asset classes, so you look at cash, you look at fixed income, you look at equities, you look at uh, commodities and precious metals, you look at private equity. We now are dealing in a financial system where the volatility in any given sector and the credit concerns in any given sector can suddenly and inexplicably skyrocket that day, whether it's for fundamental economic reasons or manage, you know, political management reasons. And so you want to have balance and you want to have a plan of dealing with that volatility because that can be an opportunity. It's one of the reasons I think a lot of us now run with higher cash positions than we did. Because one of the most significant things you can do to to get portfolio performance over long periods of time is to have cash at the right time. Now, a very important point. In 2008, 
a lot of people were able to protect themselves by being able to go to cash and fixed income. What we know today is cash and fixed income because of the changes in the too big to bail policies and other things happening globally, you know, are no longer the safe place they were. The long term bull in, in the bond market is, is coming to an end. And so the question is, you know, how instead do I learn to stay in tangibles, whether it's gold and silver, whether it's equities, whether it's private equities, whether it's land and real estate, I stay in these things and learn to love and get used to the volatility and not get rolled by it. And to me, that's one of the most important things we all have to do because otherwise, if we allow ourselves to be terrorized by the volatility, we'll be harvested in the worst way. Yeah, when all the bubbles burst, then we're all going to be taken down unless we protect ourselves. Right. I did a great Solari report with my partner, Chuck Gibson. The second, we do an equity overview every three months. And the in the second quarter, we talked about this maturing of the bull market and bonds and whether or not this now means that we're going to see a tremendous bubbling of the equity markets as a way of balancing out because the bull and bonds can't go on much longer. Uh, I certainly don't see interest rates dropping to you know, negative nominal rates. So that means I think the incentive at this point for the central bankers to engineer a bubble in equities is tremendous. And that's the big question before us. We're coming into summer, which is usually the worst time. But I think in the third and fourth Mm -hmm. quarter this year, a big question before us is, are we coming into a planetary debt for equity swap? And and if we do get negative interest rates, then mattresses really will have a premium, won't they? (laughs) You bet. Now, it's been uh, great speaking to you today, Catherine. Um, How can people find you and your Solari uh, group on the internet? Our blog is, uh, website is at solari.com and um, we blog every day and there's a lot of resources there on the website. You can also find my articles through the About Us section. Yeah, there's some great free stuff on there, which which uh, which sounds good to me because I'm a very cheap person. And Solari is S O L A R I. Thank you very much for your time today, Catherine Austin Fitz. Andy, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.